Hello, uh, I'm Steve Davies, the Head of Education here at the IEA. And today uh, we're going to be having a book club short uh, where the IEA turns to sit down with prominent free marketers, classical liberal authors and notable writers from around the world to discuss their books. And today I'm joined by academic and author Dr George Mayer to discuss his latest book. Uh, George holds a PhD uh, in the economy of the Roman Empire from King's College London. He's a fellow of the Institute and Factu Faculty, I should say, of Actuaries, uh, and was a director and trustee of the Society for the Promotion of Roman Studies. He was a partner at Tilling Us Powers Perrin, and he continues to practice consultancy in the area of actuarial science. Uh, and most recently, he's authored a fascinating book based upon the research he did for his PhD, uh, entitled Pugnare, Economic Success and Failure. So George, thank you so much for being with us to talk about your, uh, your book. Uh, let me start with the point I ended off with there in my initial remarks. Uh, it's a long time since the Roman Empire ceased to be by most conventional accounts. And you may say, as Monty Python did, what have the Romans ever done for us? So what indeed was the Roman achievement, at least in the first part of their history, and what does it have to tell us today? I, I think the major thing that the uh, Romans did for us was they uh, showed us lots of ways in which you can get things right. And uh, we, can, we can learn from that. Lots of ways in which you can organize yourselves to work together. Mm. In, um, and they also showed us uh, what a complete mess you can make of things if, mm. you, uh, if you get them wrong. They, they had a superb, uh, superb trading empire which replaced their military um, conquest model. Um, built it up uh, to an extent that's you know, quite, quite unbelievable really. Um, you know, productivity at you know, the time of the Roman Empire was uh, three times what it was in uh, medieval Europe. You yeah. know, that's like more food, three times as much food coming from the same plot of land as, as a thousand mm. years later. They, their, their ships were bigger than um, you would uh, see um, in the Mediterranean basin until probably the 18th century. They mm. invented a superb world currency which uh, collapsed uh, in the... the um, middle of the third century because of their um, mismanagement um, and the world would never again see something similar to that until yeah. the 18th century in, in England. So great achievements um, and we learn, f we learn from what um, they could do and um, we also learn from the fact that they messed it up. They messed it up indeed. So <clears throat> to summarise what you're saying here and what the book says, by, from the time of Augustus until really the early third century, the Romans create, as you say, a trading empire. They create a large integrated economy uh, which covers an enormous area, uh, the whole, all the lands around the Mediterranean and big northward extensions like Britannia and Gaul and inland Iberia. And within that area, there's a complete division of labour, essentially, so that uh, you have integrated trade, you have a highly productive economy. And if you go to somewhere like Pompeii or Herculaneum and look at the digs there, you can see that people there were living at a standard of living that would be higher than anything achieved for a very long time after that, probably again, as you say, until the 18th century. So it's an amazing achievement, and this is done partly, it's Pax Romana, uh, but there's also Roman law, so there's a common law throughout the empire and things of that sort. So you mentioned, though, it, crucially, the monetary system. So how important was the monetary system for this great achievement, the creation of this great trading economy? Um, 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 absolutely, um, uh, vital, vital. Um, the division of labour uh, that you, you mentioned there was, um, was was almost extreme. You know, you, you, if you look at memorials that are established by, uh, um, uh, set up by people uh, um, to commemorate, you know, their father or, or, or whoever, um, that they often write um, on it, you know, his profession. Uh, you can, and they're very, very specialised. You'll see some man described as a maker of eyes for statues. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to have an awful lot of, um, you know, eyes to go into statues yes. to make a living out of that. So that you know, it's it's it's, it's highly specialised, but also indicative of you know a vast amount of stuff being produced, mm -hmm. which means a lot of a lot of jobs um, and uh, a lot of opportunities. And the currency is vital to this. Um, they had uh, the largest uh, cities uh, that uh, would exist on the planet 
uh, until uh, the very end of the 18th century, uh, possibly the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and you cannot have a city such as Rome uh, with uh, a million inhabitants mm. um, without uh, a, a money system. People need to have uh, those coins that they get from their customers and that they use uh, with um, the suppliers who supply them with wine or food uh, in the little takeaways or, or, or whatever. You need to have uh, a gold coin, a silver coin and a copper coin. You need to know that the relationship you know, is, is you get uh, one a gold coin for 25 silver coins and you need to know that that's not going to be disputed in the shops. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to uh, be able to, you know, get on a boat, uh, go across to Alexandria and know that, you know, it's acceptable there. You're not going to be haggling about, well, actually today I feel like just giving you uh, um, 10 gold coin, t 10 silver coins for that gold coin and, and all the rest. So mm. vital. And, and what they did, um, and th this isn't uh, very much appreciated, is they built a superb banking system. Mm -hmm. So uh, Seneca, the uh, teacher of Nero, uh, transferred about 200 million in, in our money to London. Um, you know, not as a charity, but to lend out to the locals um, at interest. Um, and, and indeed, when he called this money in, because he needed it back at Rome, very suddenly he triggered. It was one of the reasons why the revolt by Budasir was, was, was yeah. triggered. And, you know, he, he didn't do that by, you know, sending coins in, you know, tons of coins in a ship. He did it through um, an international uh, banking system um, supported by a uniform law, the same uh, in Rome as in London. Um, and you know, that trade, that specialization is not possible um, to that extent on, unless you have a uh, currency that is trusted over, over a wide area. Yeah. So uh, you basically you have a stable currency mm -hmm. which doesn't inflate and that currency mm. also has a stable unit of account so yes. the ratio between the two different types of money remains constant and stable and predictable over yes. time. And it's that quality in other words of predictability you're arguing Absolutely. which makes possible uh, people planning forward in the future and engaging into Absolutely. things like long term contracts like insurance contracts your own line of business yeah, 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 yeah. and the banking system. So what kind of things had the Romans uh, from Augustus onwards had to do to create this really quite previously unprecedented uh, mm. phenomenon of a, a large geographical, stable, predictable currency system. What did they had to do that made it possible? There was a, a Greek fellow called Polybius mm. and he asked himself a, a, sim a similar question and it, it was um, about 200 years before Augustus, you know, why are they more successful um, than us, the Greeks? You know, because the Romans had come in and you know, conquered the, the, the Greeks. Mm. The Greeks lost, um, and his answer was in their constitution. Um, so how they how they organise themselves, mm. um, and it's kind of interesting that the way they organise themselves was. Um, kind of like how companies nowadays organize themselves. Mm. You've got shareholders who vote on this and that, you've got a board of directors, and you've got, uh, you've got an executive, a chief executive. Um, but the other thing that was important about them was they were adaptable. As, mm. as and when things needed to change, um, they, they changed. Mm -hmm. um, so one of, one of the things they had was they had a tribune of the people. I mean, he represented uh, the, um, the plebeians mm. and that fundamental change to their, their constitution, the introduction of a man with, with power of veto of, over the other magistrates uh, came about when the plebeians weren't happy with the way things were being run and they went on strike. They mm. withdrew from Rome and um, the change happened. What happened for them uh, around the time of Augustus was their old constitution wasn't working. This whole system of having um, annual elections and, and all the rest um, uh, wasn't, wasn't working. Mm -hmm. um, prominent individuals were tearing at each other um, and, and they changed. And so instead of having um, these annual elections, they, in my view, collectively allowed a new position, a head of state for life mm -hmm. to emerge, um, but not um, not an unaccountable head of, of state. There is still the Senate. It's not, it's not elimin eliminated. It is still fundamental uh, to the uh, lawmaking 
um, mm. process. And indeed it has the power uh, to condemn uh, the head of state uh, mm. to death. You know, something mm. for him to think about. So I, I think it came about because um, of their constitution, the way they organized themselves, and by the fact that uh, uh, they were willing to adapt and change as necessary. Mm. And so essentially what you're saying is they had an effective decision-making procedure and yes. process, yes. But they were, and they were therefore able and willing to make tough decisions when the occasion required it, but also to change when yes. it was clear that the old Republican constitution, for example, was with the two consuls was no longer working sure. and they needed to create the princeps, the principate, to, to run things. So they've created this uh, stable monetary system. Uh, one of the things I know you mentioned is the way that they'd also centralised the production of money, the physical production of money. Sure. Uh, in Rome, so that there wasn't mint dotted all over the place that anybody could get hold of. Sure. So I suppose the question to ask is, well, uh, as George Best famously got asked in a hotel room, where did it all go wrong? That uh, is, 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 is a great uh, question. Um, and in my book, Pognare, I, I lay out the events that are happening. I um, lay out the stories of, you know, Commodus, of Marcus Aurelius, you know, of um, Commodus mocking, mocking the Senate, for example. Um, and also um, the mismanagement of the state finances. Uh, and and, and you, you, you can look at all of that, and um, I've written this book so you can form your, your own answer on all of that. But I, I, think, I think it was complacency. Mm -hmm. I think it was complacency. I think it was, you know, they had had stability for well over a hundred years, you know, mm. the, the ports are, are functioning beautifully, you know, there's a mass of goods to buy in the markets and all the rest, mm. you know, and it's, you know, as it's been, um, you know, in living memory and um, memory of their, their parents and grandparents. And I, th I think maybe they just forgot what was really important yeah. to all of this um, and they no longer paid attention. And they no longer notice that you know this is going a bit awry, and it's not trivial. This actually matters. Mm -hmm. So my view is um, is complacency, and, and you know could happen to us now. And I, I, I suppose to further to what you say there, what they lost sight of was the centrality of having a stable financial and monetary system for the whole system that they were benefiting from. They, as you say, took it for granted, really, and they forgot that that was what it all rested upon, essentially. And. Um, underneath that, there are um, things such as uh, a Senate, um, uh, which is receiving news, which is listening to what's happening, and which is saying, you know, maybe this shouldn't happen, maybe, maybe the world is changing, we need to change, mm. you know, because the world never stays the same. Yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah, and indeed, I mean, I, I would just point to one thing, which is that uh, one of the things that does change is the sudden appearance on the Roman Empire's eastern flank of a rival empire of equal power, the Neo-Persian Empire of the Sasanians. Sure. Uh, and this means that the Romans suddenly face something they haven't faced since the Punic Wars, really, which is a military threat that is a massive. Uh, and their response is to enormously increase military spending. Now, that's a crucial part in your story, so why is it exactly? I, I, I think I might, um, might uh, take a, a slightly different view mm. on that in terms of the newness of the threat. Mm. It, it's, always, it's, it's always been there, mm -hmm. um, and indeed it still is. Um, mm. you, you know, I mean, you read the newspapers and you hear about difficulties coming from, from Iran. Mm. And the, the threat that the Romans had um, through their history was was often was mm. often from there. Um, so sometimes it's we, we think it's a new enemy, but it it can actually or a new problem, and it can actually be um, an old problem that people are no longer quite so good at dealing with. Right. And yeah. um, I, I I think that's a fundamental to it. Um, and it can also be that you know the wrong solution is now being applied to it. I mean, paying soldiers, you know, a large amount of extra money mm -hmm. um, and putting a massive burden on the state's finances for doing the same amount of work and maybe making some of them think there might be more to come uh, isn't good for discipline. Mm 
right. and isn't good for uh, success against um, well-trained, disciplined mm -hmm. soldiers. So, you know, Augustus had a very disciplined approach. Yeah. Um, by the time you come to Marcus Aurelius, maybe it's not so disciplined. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the famous episode is, uh, of course, that when uh, Commodus, whom you mentioned, after he's overthrown, there's a brief, another emperor for a brief while, and then the Praetorian Guards actually sell off the imperial title to the highest bidder. Uh, and this provokes a political crisis, which eventually ends up with Septimius Severus becoming uh, the emperor. Now, uh, what exactly happens at this time? How is it that at that point, the monetary system you described uh, really stops working? Um, yeah, yeah, at this stage, I mean, Septimius Severus basically, um, you know, um, buys the um, support of the army by doubling their pay. Hmm. You know, you, t you take the largest item of your, uh, your budget and you double it, you're going to have a problem. So if, um, if the authorities in the UK were to say that tomorrow they'll double the, the, you know, the amount of paid to um, the NHS, I mean, hmm. it's going to be a shock to the system and it might not re recover from that. Um, what happens? Um, the money has to come from somewhere. Um, it's a it's, uh, silver-based um, uh, system, uh, so you start to devalue. And there have always been devaluation. It had gone like this, and now it goes like this. Right. Um, and once you start it, once they started it, it was like an addiction. Right. You know, it just had to keep going. And when it goes like that, it goes down to um, zero. Mm. I mean, the, the, the coins that are then produced, I mean, hardly have any silver in it, it's just washed over uh, the surface to try and fool people into thinking they're silver. It's, it's I mean, it's gone really then. Yeah. So in the third century then, which is what we're talking about here basically, sure. uh, the empire, um, they make this fatal decision to try and fund a large increase in their major spending items sure. through debasing the currency. Sure. Uh, and so they destroy that stable monetary system sure. that had been built up after Augustus, uh, which had played such a crucial part in creating this amazing economy and infrastructure sure. they built. So what was the result of their doing this? Um, well, once uh, the, uh, the coinage is, is, is no longer respected, um, uh, the, the banks are gone. So mm. they're gone. They disappear uh, from the record. Um, mm. No more mention of them for a good few hundred years. Um, so that um, messes, up, messes up trade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and before, um, before this chaos, you know, um, Ships travelled across the Mediterranean. You know they didn't need to carry coins. You know, documentary proof and uh, effectively bank transfers by letter. Um, and from 250 onwards, it's the first time you really start to find uh, coins on shipwrecks in, mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean and industrial quantities of them. Um, so trade is uh, is severely hampered. That means um, high unemployment because you know fewer customers. Um, Urban life becomes very difficult. You know, you, um, if you haven't got a currency, how can you know? How can you live in in, in, in a city? Uh, people start to leave leave the city, um, and um, it, um, that becomes de um, depopulated. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cities do um, um, with with no uh, regular payments for, for for the soldiers. They are effectively mercenaries. Um, there's a lot of uh, disorder. Mm. So for hundreds of years, I mean, and especially through the trading empire miracle, there had been no need to build a wall around Rome. Mm -hmm. um, just absolutely no need. Mm. 250, massive wall is built, yeah. um, which still survives. Yeah, the wall of Aurelian indeed, yeah, yes. Exactly, which was needed in Italy until I think the early part of the 19th century. So the peace that, existed, that had existed until 250 AD did not exist in Italy uh, until into the 19th century. Yeah, until the Resort Gemento, in fact, really, uh, yes. Ab ab absolutely. Yeah. So there was something, something really, really lost. Yes. And so all this comes essentially from debauching the currency because uh, it deranges the whole economic system, is what you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. If you want to have a, a you know, specialised trade you know, as a maker of eyes for statues uh, or, or, or as an actuary, uh, or indeed as, as a historian, mm. you, you need to have a currency, you know, yeah. so that you can um, get money from someone 
and be able to give it on to someone else who gives you what you really need, which mm, is food, indeed. drink, and a place to live. And so in the absence of a reliable currency, you have a quite different kind of economy, much Absolutely. more localised, uh, much less productive, uh, and much more subject to rent extraction, I would add, also by I think that's predatory right landlords. Yes. So. Um, you said that we can learn from the Romans about how to get things right, uh, mm. and we just talked about what they meant got wrong, like a major policy error really in the third century from which uh, arguably they never recovered. Um, so are we in danger? Could we do the same thing now? Absolutely. I mean, yes, do you think so? So how might we do it? Do uh, well, just, I mean, if, if you want to know how to do it. Um, I, I think we, um, given, given that we're no different to them in, um, in intelligence, um, mm given that um, you know, human nature hasn't changed. Um, uh, yes, we could do it um, mm. uh, again. I, I think we could um, do it by being complacent. I think mm. we could uh, do it by not understanding what are the parts of our system that really matter. Mm. Um, yeah, I think one way in which um, you could do it, uh, if you wanted to try, is, is by um, excessively um, you know, making money out of thin air. I mean, uh, a load of money has been created in the, in the last year. Um, so in the United Kingdom, um, 450 billion was yeah. magicked out of thin air. Um, so for every 2,000 pounds of money there was um, about 18 months ago, there's now 2,500 pounds of money. Yeah. Um, and that was absolutely necessary to uh, yeah. keep an economy alive and, and jobs uh, uh, continue to exist and so forth. Um, but if that you know, uh, mechanism is, is abused, you end up in exactly the position that the Romans were, mm. in, where, in which excessive amounts of money are created, the currency is no longer as valued as it was, and th in very important things then fall apart. Yes, indeed. And I would add, add to that, George, I mean, I think uh, the United States, for example, I think is perhaps in danger at the moment of going down the route that Septimius Severus and uh, his fellows did in the third century because they've expanded their domestic broad money supply by 35 percent mm -hmm. and are poised to expand it even further. And I suppose the real risk, uh, I don't know if you agree with this, is that you can do things like that on a kind of one-off basis to meet an emergency crisis, the real danger is you, you get into the habit, as you say, you get hooked and it's like a drug that you keep on using, because once you've set off down that road, very hard to recover. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right, and I, I think the United States have started on, uh, on an experiment, and I hope it works out well for all of us. Yeah. Um, right. And as, as, as you said, I mean, it was the problem of um, you know, Septimius Severus. You, you give the soldiers a you know, 100% um, pay increase, and there's a likelihood they'll come back and ask for more next year. Yeah. Um, so this money going out, if it's being in, in the United States, if it's going out in a, a properly um, managed way, then it will do good. Hmm. If it's done in such a way that it creates an addiction, then it will be an absolute hmm. disaster. And I suppose the thing to conclude is if you were a Roman growing up in uh, you know, Italy or in fact any part of the Roman Empire at the end of, say, the Rome, reign of Antoninus Pius, you're, you think you're living in this amazing world, you've yes. got these huge aqueducts bringing yes. water 135 miles, for yes. example, in the case of Carthage, uh, incredible civil engineering, and you must think, oh, this is going to go on forever. Exactly. And I suppose the lesson is oh, it doesn't have to. You know, it can very easily suddenly unravel. Sure, and that, that is uh, one of the reasons why um, you know, your organisation does such important work, because it's essential that in the population there are enough people who understand how these things work. Yeah. And, and, and if, there are, uh, if, if, if there aren't enough of those people, then there won't be enough people saying, this is a great thing to do. I wouldn't try that. Yes, indeed. Uh, and to basically to learn from history, if I might add for that. Uh, to, to learn from our predecessors. Yes, precisely. So thank you very much for that, George. I think this is a, a, a fascinating conversation. And uh, I would sort of like encourage everyone here to, uh, to buy George's book here, Pugnare. Uh, the front piece, he tells me, is the kind of conventional story about how the Roman Empire comes to its end, which is barbarian invasions, uh, as in a really bad film starring Christopher for example. Uh, but in fact, the real story is here in the bank, which is the uh, capture of the Emperor Valerian by the Persian Shah 
Charpour, uh, and the debasement of these coins that we see dotted all over uh, the back here, and the self-inflicted wound of the undermining of the infrastructure of the economy, which had actually been the base of Roman civilization. So thank you very much. No, oh, thank you very much. I couldn't have done a better plug if I tried. Well, thank you. So. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for you in the audience for listening to this. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation and found it fruitful. And as I say, I encourage you all to go and uh, read George's book uh, and learn indeed from, from it what the Romans uh, have to offer us today in terms of advice and warnings. Uh, I'd also like to thank particularly uh, the book club members who support these programs, uh, the donors whose continued support makes the work of the IEA possible, uh, and the IEA online patrons uh, who also make possible this particular aspect of our work. Uh, and if you're not one of these already, uh, I encourage you to uh, join in uh, each of these endeavours. So thank you all very much, uh, and I look forward to meeting you all again online, uh, or rather in, in person at physical IEA events. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.